Chairing the next session are Dr. Martin Green, Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, Dr. Raghavendra Bhatt, Professor and Head of the Department of Medicine, Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, and Dr. Srinivas Kakalaya, Consultant Physician, Mangalore. Kindly occupy your seats. I invite the speaker, Dr. Jitendra Singh Makar, onto the dais to speak on bundle branch blocks and its significance. I request the chairpersons to introduce Dr. Jitendra Singh. Dr. Jitendra Singh Makar, the Senior Inter Interventional Cardiologist and Director of the Electrophysiology and Heart Failure Services at the new Eternal Heart Care Center and Research Institute, Jaipur. It is very interesting to note that he has just traveled around half the world. We had a nice chat with him yesterday. He was in Mount Sinai Hospital where one of our old students, Dr. Annapurna, a Guinness Book record holder, is working. Then he moved on to Ottawa, went to Jaipur, now he is here. I don't know what is his next halt. Very <laughs> interesting person, I can tell you. Switch off everything else except your eyes and ears and listen. Good morning, uh, respected chairpersons. It's real pleasure to be on dais with Dr. Martin Green and other dignitaries. I'm amazed to see the audience here, the presence in early morning. It's very unlike our part of the country. That shows a lot of zeal of learning in this part of country. I'm thankful to the organizers uh, for inviting me and congratulate for making such a wonderful uh, uh, curriculum, scientific curriculum, which is at the grassroot level and indicated uh, uh, most useful for our practicing physicians. Uh, my topic is bundle branch block. Uh, I, there's a little bit uh, gap of communication. I kept the title as left bundle branch block and significance. And I think the left bundle branch block is more significant, so <laughs> that will do. Okay, what scares you more, right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block? I'm just talking about an incidental asymptomatic patient coming in the clinic and you see an RBBB or LBBB. Those who think that RBBB scares you more can raise their hands. Nobody. So, or as one person, I think we need to talk in person later on because <laughs> In 20 minutes, it's difficult to interact like that. But I think most of people think that left bundle branch is more significant. So conclusion of talk is there now to elaborate a little bit on this. Right bundle branch is more common in general population, younger age group, more common with structurally normal heart, usually benign, good prognosis. Left bundle branch block in general asymptomatic population is less commoner than uh, right bundle branch block, it present in older age groups, more common with structural heart disease, more chances of progression, it's a predictor of structural heart disease, and prognosis is worse than right bundle branch block. So uh, back to basics, uh, the normal conduction system, everybody knows, the SA node, then it's hypothetical atrial bundles, then AV node, then there is a right bundle and left bundle. If you go into detail, the left bundle has two fascicles. One is the posterior fascicle and uh, posterior fascicle and anterior fascicle. Posterior fascicle is more fanned out, have more fibers and uh, travel posteriorly into the LV wall. This I am highlighting uh, because the left bundle has two fascicle and anterior fascicle Posterior fascicle is fanned out in a larger area. So left bundle branch block itself means there is more associated damage in the heart. What is a bundle branch block? It is just, actually it is a various degree of slowing of conduction velocity in a one bundle branch and preferential conduction over the other bundle branch. When we talk bundle branch block, it may not be blocked absolutely. It is just the slow conduction which is giving way to the other bundle branch. So even the complete may not be complete. It seems complete, but it is not the complete block. Just we take an example. This is an ECG. This patient has LBBB. And just a hypothetical situation. This happened in one of my patients, but these are not the ECG of that patient. This, this patient had a dilated cardiomyopathy. He had recurrent VT. We 
took uh, him for EP study, it was a bundle branch re-entry VT. And for bundle branch re-entry VT, the treatment is right bundle branch ablation. So we did that. So patient has left bundle branch block and we ablated the right bundle branch. So what's going to happen? Complete heart block, that is what is expected. But this is supposed the ECG after the ablation. So that means LVVV had something to conduct but because it was slow or the right bundle conduction was dominant now right bundle has been ablated so now it is presenting like right bundle branch block and left that left bundle is still conducting but there is then the first degree AV block will appear of course the PR interval will be longer but it just to say that complete a bundle branch block doesn't mean that structurally that bundle branch can't conduct at all it is just the preferential conduction and this concept is good to understand what is incomplete LVVV it is gradually worsening of conduction in that particular bundle branch block which, which will appear like incomplete bundle branch block earlier and then it will turn into complete bundle branch block so left bundle branch block itself is a bifascicular block because it involves both the left fascicle, uh, anterior fascicle and posterior fascicle LBVV that can result due to block in proximal undivided portion of the left bundle but which is very rare mostly in most cases it is due to block in both the fascicles which means that a large area of left ventricle is involved that's why it is associated with the worse prognosis that's why it is associated with heart failure and all that stuff so complete LBVV how does it looks like the QRS duration is more than 120 millisecond this terminal S wave in lead V1 and terminal R wave in lead V, uh, lead 1, AVL and V6 and then there are a lot of secondary STT changes which are con uh, discordant to the QRS complex. Complete RBBB is uh, 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 indicated by terminal R wave in lead V1, usually RSR pattern and a notched deep S wave in lead 1, AVL and V6. This is if you compare the right bundle branch this is normal v1 this is how v1 looks like in uh, right bundle this is how v1 looks like in left bundle these findings are like you know they're like elephants once you see you don't forget that these are the elephant this is the elephant you don't need, need to apply these criteria all the time and uh, this is like v6 normal v6 this is how it looks like uh, in this is complete branch block uh, Obviously, this is how it looks like in right bundle branch block. This is how it looks like in left bundle branch block. So, uh, what is significance of left bundle branch block? The significance depends on what kind of scenario you are finding clinically the left bundle branch block. We'll discuss in uh, various headings. Incidentally detected left bundle branch block, acute MI with left bundle branch block, LBBB with heart failure, LBBB with recurrent syncope, intermittent left bundle branch block, and exercise induced left bundle branch block. See, if we talk about incidentally detected LBBB in asymptomatic patients, the incidence is generally 0.8 to 1.1%. Generally, it is a marker of underlying prolonged hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, or valvular heart disease. Any patients who is presenting with LVVB should be taken very seriously and should be investigated thoroughly. ECG, echocardiography and Holter monitoring. These three are the basic tests. Whenever you find LVVB, you should do these tests basically. Almost 50% of these patients, this is a, uh, data from Framingham, Framingham Heart Study where 28 years follow up was available for patients who developed LVVB. Almost 50% of them, they developed structural heart disease in form of cardiomyopathy or valvular heart disease, particularly aortic stenosis and uh, coronary artery disease. <coughs> the mortality in patients with left bundle branch block is 1.5 to 2 times higher than general population which doesn't have left bundle branch block. So it is really significant. If we find a new onset LVVV, New onset LBBB with chest pain is considered as ST elevation MI, particularly if it is supported with the enzyme rise, but that happens late. So whenever there is a new onset LBBB with chest pain, we take it as MI and uh, 
this is an indication for thrombolysis. But the problem is that in most of the cases, the previous ECG is not available and if it is available, it may be of six months uh, uh, previous ECG which doesn't uh, inform much. But if there is new onset LVBB with acute MI, this happens mostly with interior wall MI, with large MI. Rarely it can happen with circumflex or RCA blocks due to AV nodal artery block and proximal portion of left bundle branch, undivided part of left bundle branch block. If it is LBB with acute MI, this is a sign of poor prognosis, increased morbidity, increased mortality in form of cardiogenic shock and death and ventricular arrhythmias. So if you got, get a new onset LBBV and you don't have a previous ECG, is there any method to uh, differentiate whether it is new onset LBBV or if it is associated with chest pain, there are some signs which we'll discuss which uh, suggest that there is acute MI associated with LBBV. But if this is just LBBV, asymptomatic LBBV, there is one study where they hypothesize that the T wave amplitude is higher in uh, newer left bundle branch blocks and T wave amplitude with time it goes down. But I don't think we are using this hypothesis in our clinical practice. Acute MI with LBBB, it could be acute MI with pre-existing LBBB. It is difficult to diagnose, but if we apply some criteria, this Sarvosa criteria is very popular. You all of you must be knowing. The feature suggestive of acute MI in LBBB is the ST changes in same direction, either concordant uh, ST depression or concordant ST elevation in limb leads more than one millimeter or discordant ST elevation, which is usually there in LBBB, two or three millimeters. If it is more than five millimeter in precordial leads, then it suggests MI. And STT changes in the same direction as QRS complex, that suggests uh, acute ischemia in cases of LBBB and suggests that these are the primary STT changes. This is one example, patient of uh, LBBB presenting with MI. You see ST elevation here, which is concordant to the QRS complex, more than one millimeter. This is discordant ST, uh, concordant ST depression, one millimeter, and then STT changes are in the same direction as QRS complex. Another scenario, very common scenario and very important clin in clinical practice is left bundle branch block in patients with heart failure. This is a definitely a uh, different population needs to be treated differently than those who doesn't have left bundle branch block. Almost 28%, few studies say up to 40% of heart failure patients have conduction abnormalities. Uh, specific data is not available, but most of them are LBBB, more than half. And this LBBB results into electrical and mechanical dyssynchrony, and that dyssynchrony is associated with worsening of functional status of the heart failure patient. And these patients, they respond, respond to cardiac resynchronization therapy very well. So that's why this, is, this makes a different population. Now, left bundle branch block with heart failure can be a mere association because LBBB also suggests that there's a lot of fibrosis and apoptosis and myocardial damage, is, damage in the left ventricle. But does it have a causal relationship also? Because in clinical practice, we see that patient first First, they present with LBBB, and then gradually over the years, there is uh, uh, cardiomyopathy and heart failure. So this may be one, indi one indication, maybe that this LBBB is early sign of cardiomyopathy and conduction system is involved before the muscles, or maybe the LBBB has some causal relationship with the heart failure, which is true, because LBBB, left bundle branch block, causes dyssynchrony and that can contribute to origin of heart failure or worsening of heart failure, both. In this example, as you see in normal cases, what you see is that the LV ejection and RV ejection, they continue for the same period, almost same period, or the LV, it precedes little bit the RV. But in case of left bundle branch block and wide QRS, what happens is LV ejection is prolonged. So aortic wall closes after the pulmonary valve and LV filling time reduces. If filling time reduces, then 
the stroke volume will also reduce because LV is not filled properly, so stroke volume and cardiac output will also reduce. So this is one mechanism where LVVB could be responsible for heart failure. Uh, this is from European Heart Journal which shows that the mortality in f and uh, the events in form of coronary artery disease, CHF, stroke, diabetes, everything is more in LVBB patients than control patients. LVBB with recurrent syncope uh, is very common. Once, whenever we see a patient of LVBB coming with syncope, and if patient with bifascicular block coming with syncope, this LBB patient alerts me more that he needs a pacemaker. In bifascicular block, I think twice, thrice and do all the tests. In fact, in LBBB patient also, you have to document that patient is having intermittent bradycardia, then you advise a pacemaker. But I have not seen any patient who has LBBB recurrent syncope not ending up with a pacemaker. So this is a very specific sign that patient is having intermittent complete heart block. Holter, nowadays this external loop recorder should be done for such patient to document bradycardia. Otherwise, this is one of the uh, good indications for EP study where you can measure HV interval. If with LBBB, HV interval is significantly prolonged, patient becomes a, uh, that suggests a trifascicular disease and patient becomes a candidate for uh, pacemaker. But if HV interval is normal, one can follow the patient clinically, but most of these patients would eventually end up needing a pacemaker. Problem comes when these patients uh, of, uh, suppose a patient of dilated cardiomyopathy with LVBB presents with recurrent syncope. This is a, a same ECG of a lady who came with the LVBB ejection fraction of 25% recurrent syncope. Now if it is cardiomyopathy, you think of both bradyarrhythmia as well as tachyarrhythmia. So I admitted her and uh, kept for EP study next day, but this patient developed complete heart block in the night and uh, we were certain that the cause of uh, bradycardia, cause of syncope is bradycardia, complete heart block, but then question between CRTP and CRTD, those who are not the uh, subject of this uh, topic. Intermittent LVBB, most of the time we find it is also associated with higher chances of converting to complete heart block. And this more uh, commonly we see intermittent LBBB than intermittent RBBB, but in some cases it may be a functional rate related block which can be suggested on Holter if you see the left development of left bundle branch block with heart rate changes. Exercise induced left bundle branch block is also a marker of underlying ischemia. The earlier few studies negated this fact, but this is true that patient who develop LBBB, they should be subjected to further uh, testing for coronary artery disease. Approximately 70% of uh, these patients who have LBBB on exercise test would have underlying CAD. Not only underlying CAD, but this is associated with more clinical events uh, of uh, cardiovascular uh, origin. And it is a marker of severe coronary artery disease. I remind you that left bundle branch block has a dual supply from PDA as well as the LAD. So if LVBB is developing on exercise, that may suggest a triple vessel disease. So that way exercise induced LVBB is a specific finding and should be taken as marker of ischemia. So conclusion is that LVBB is not usually a benign condition and should be thoroughly investigated may cause or worsen the heart failure. CRT is useful in presence of LBBB and heart failure. Acute onset LBBB with chest pain should be taken as MI, should be given benefit of doubt and should be thrombolized on time. Acute MI in presence of left bundle branch block which is pre-existing is difficult to diagnose but is still possible and treated on time. Thanks a lot. Thank you for... Thanks for that excellent presentation. I have one question. Um, as cardiac resynchronization therapy is becoming more and more popular and clearly uh, beneficial, I wondered if you would comment on left bundle branch block versus non-specific interventricular conduction delay and how we differentiate them and whether or not 
we should be differentiating them in terms of response to cardiac resynchronization. Yeah. See, the, as such, if we see the indication uh, of CRT is just the wide QRS, it doesn't specify whether it should be LBBB or RBBB. But these studies suggest that uh, RBBB these days uh, is considered that they are the most of the non responders are uh, right bundle branch block. So, uh, in our practice, we recommend uh, CRT to LBBB patients and non specific uh, conduction abnormalities if QRS is really wide, more than 140. And then mechanical desynchrony in uh, presence of these conduction disturbances uh, form, uh, revealed by 2D echocardiography or tissue Doppler imaging can further help us in uh, selecting a good candidate for CRT. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful session. Thank Next you, sir. Time. Thank you. This is very important. This has been troubling me since a long time. Left bundle branch block can occur with normal axis. Left mm -hmm. bundle branch block can occur with right axis. Left bundle branch block can also occur with right axis. The merit clearly tells if the left bundle branch block occurs with left axis deviation, then it is more sinister. And uh, is it always necessary that LBBB has to have an LAD? And if the LAD is very high, say minus 60, minus, because this is a very, uh, very important thing. When you said LBBB is more sinister, yes, I agree, as you said, the Rosenbach uh, series. But would you like to add axis? I would be very happy if you say yes. And many a times I sit and think, this LBBB, this lady has got, but she has a normal axis. Yeah. And Marriott has clearly given, in LBBB, sometimes they can have right axis also. Yeah. So, I would like to know from you, and I feel if LBBB associated with LAD, it's more sinister. If LBBB not associated with LAD, keep a good watch on that. Please comment. Right. Your first submission that uh, LBBB can have variable axis is true. That's true because LBBB, uh, just to say LBB is not enough, it's a big structure. So level of block and uh, some studies like from Angelo Recchio has demonstrated that there's a specific pattern of uh, left bundle branch block which helps in recognizing the uh, beneficiaries for CRT. But this uh, prognosis, depending on the axis with LBBB, I am not aware if some expert can throw light on this. If there's some particular axis with LBBB is more dangerous than that, that I don't. In general, in general, I think that left bundle branch block associated with left axis deviation is generally associated with a markedly enlarged left ventricle and a worse prognosis. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Martin Green to hand over a certificate to the speaker, Dr. Jitendra Singh. And I request Dr. Jitendra Singh to hand over the certificates to the chairperson.